Hi, my name is John Hoffman, and uh, I'm here with the owners of the TA Guest Ranch, uh, Barbara and uh, uh, Earl and Madsen. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the restoration of this place, because it uh, has quite a bit of history of its own. So, uh, uh, Earl, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit, a, a brief history of, uh, of the ranch, just in a kind of a Reader's Digest version of where this place started and and what it looked like when you first got here, and then we'll take it from there. It was first started between 1880 and 1882 by a doctor in Laramie by the name of William Paris. And uh, he bought the herd and the brand from a rancher in the, the Laramie area by the name of Tom Olson. And the initials TA on his brand came from Tom Olson. And he brought the herd and the brand here and started this ranch. It's, it's not clear exactly what uh, he had in mind because he was an absentee owner and uh, he was loosely affiliated with the cattle barons of the Johnson County War fame and his ranch foreman Charles Ford uh, was here at the time of the Johnson County War and participated with the cattle baron group in the killing of Nick Ray and Nate Champion in, uh, at the KC camp. So uh, that was a very unpopular event here. And ultimately, uh, the townspeople insisted that Charlie Ford be terminated and taken away from the ranch. And within a few short years after that, William Harris traded the ranch for another ranch in South Dakota on the border and vacated the area. I think uh, the animosities coming from the Johnson County War was purely a part of all of that. Then the Gammon family came in. They were the ones that had the ranch in South Dakota that traded to William Harris. Okay. And the Gammon family is very interesting. They came here and uh, really did a wonderful job on uh, taking care of the buildings, restoring the ranch. Uh, they did cattle and uh, they had a very active uh, reading program for Percheron draft horses. That one was that? That was, they started here about 1904 or 5, okay. and on into the 20s and 30s, I would say, would, from my knowledge of it, is the heyday of what they were doing with their draft animals. Of course, then that gentleman by the name of John Deere came along a few years later, and uh, about the time going into World War II, and so draft horses became less of an item, and so they moved into other operations, into livestock operations. And that family lasted three or more generations here until the late 1970s. They then, uh, by that time, uh, the economics of ranching had developed to the point where it was very difficult without some extra income to help. And uh, things had been going downhill for a while, so they put it on the market and sold it. Uh, ultimately, there was a group of brothers, the Long Brothers, that came in and bought it and were very effective operators until we had that big blizzard in 1984, which was a 500-year blizzard. And it just wiped out the livestock industry here for, for a considerable period and bankrupted them. To their credit, they came back and paid off all the debts, but they put the ranch on the market and it dwindled on the market for a while and had a few people come in and take a nibble at it, but not much. So by the time we were looking for it in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the place was on the market uh, through the bank and uh, it had deteriorated to a very rundown state. I would say that uh, uh, we did the complete restoration of it, which, which Barbara uh, headquartered and, and uh, did pretty much all the design and the work on. Uh, I would give the Gammon family credit in that they did not destroy the buildings. <coughs> when we bought the ranch, the community sentiment was, we we'll just bulldoze these old buildings down and start from scratch. And so we really didn't have much of an idea initially 
that we were going to do anything when we bought the ranch in January of 1991, that we were going to do anything other than just have a cattle ranch operation here and a place to uh, come to when we uh, retired from my law practice. But, and that uh, was down in Denver? That was in Golden, Colorado, and Golden. Denver, yes. <laughs> we were in Golden because the main client of our firm was uh, Coors Industries, yeah, of course, Coors Industries, and so we always stayed right in Golden with our with our headquarters. So that's that's what the plan was, and uh, Barbara, remarkably, had done a, a three-year program of space planning and construction uh, planning at the University of Colorado and got a degree in that, and she did very, very well in that program. I think uh, she did that after our kids were grown, so I think she spotted everybody by about 20 years in her class. But I think she ended up at the very top of the class, and as a result, she was given a, a, a token of appreciation to work with much of associates, architects be in their office at least for about a six month period. Wow. And during that period, uh, they had asked Barbara to come up with a plan to renovate the carriage house on the facility next to the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs. Okay. At that time, it was being used as a school, and notably, Chris Christopherson's kids and some others were at that school. And Barbara came up with a plan for that, and un unknown to everybody except her later, later uh, they adopted the plan and they implemented it and did, did that restoration. Well, then she had those spurs on her uh, accomplishment list. And then within a year, we bought the ranch here. And so she was right in her element to come in here and do the whole restoration project, which she, she quarterbacked that from every aspect of it, from the bricks foundation uh, through the equipment and uh, all the accoutrements, such as uh, Victorian era wallpaper from San Francisco, etc. And in the meantime of that, she wrecked our house in Golden because she would buy antique furniture and antique yeah. brass lights that we were going to use. And so our garage in the back half of the house was a storage unit for every kind of lighting device and piece of equipment and furniture that you could see. We have an 1850 library in our conference room here that was part of that, uh, that she found and had someone restore. So that's that's how it all started and that's how it got going. Of course, when we got here, it was a pretty much of a mess. Uh, just for an example, you couldn't get into the ranch house because the doors wouldn't open. Why wouldn't they open? Because when they built this, in the 1881 or 1882, they used pitch posts and flat rocks for the foundation. Sure. Now, okay. the, the logs were sawn at the mouth of the Bighorn Mountains, Crazy Woman Canyon, I believe, and uh, with a uh, military saw from the early years. And those logs were 9 by 13 inches. So it was a gorgeous facility, beautifully done. And the uh, logs were laid in like bricks instead of the traditional log and chinking that you've seen with round logs or, or even square logs mm -hmm. and chinking. These were metered in, mortared in, and with, with of course, chinking, but, but like a brick layer. And so it was a very unique building and it was uh, a very handsome building. But when we came here, you couldn't crawl in and get inside because the pitch post, particularly on the West End had disintegrated, and so the floor had bowed, and so the floor was bowed, and the frame was bowed, so the doors wouldn't open, etc., etc., and all the plaster and so forth from the ceiling had come tumbling down, and, and on first glance, you would think this was a complete mess. But uh, somehow Barbara got me a lantern, a battery-powered lantern, and had me climb up to check everything in the rafters, and uh, I reported to her that the, the frame was as good as the day it was made, as near as I could tell, and that uh, it just wasn't a situation where we could just bulldoze the building down. And so 
what we did was we started out, we took our livestock budget and restored the ranch. <laughs> and so it's been uh, nip and tuck practically ever since, but we've enjoyed every minute of it. We've had our own cattle ranch in operation and we've uh, found the resources one way or another and, and with occasional friendly bankers uh, to do the, re the basic restoration. But on a ranch of this size and with the developments now on the guest ranch, uh, developing it is a constant year-round process. Well, tell me a little bit about the metamorphosis. It, it was a cattle ranch. And was it your decision, Barbara, to develop this uh, guest ranch? It was my decision. No, it, okay. not really. Uh, I'm saying that the guest ranch kind of took on a life of its own. But my idea was basically to save the buildings. And um, when we did that with the initial buildings, we had uh, law buddies at Earl that said, boy, would we love to come out. It was when the movie City Slickers came out. Okay, or sure. Not too long after. And they said, it'd be so fun. We're going to bring our nephews and we're going to play cowboy. And, and that's kind of where the guest ranch idea was born. Uh, but it took a huge jump when the uh, the Tau, uh company found us and they were scouting for a real ranch to host their guests who go between South Dakota and Jackson Hole and halfway in between is Buffalo, Wyoming. And they were looking for an authentic ranch and they came to us and said, you're as authentic as it gets. You've got all that history. You were a real cattle ranch. We'd love to come here. And that's when the guest ranch exploded. And it's been uh, uh, a major part of our operation since then. Um, in fact, it's gotten so major that we have a lot more employees when the guest ranch season is going than we do for the cattle ranch. But um, we then decided to expand the number of buildings that we were using, so we uh, turned some non-residential buildings into residences, such as the one that we're in right now, which was a granary that held grain when the gamins were feeding all of their pressure on horses. Well, it is now a conference center with guest rooms. Well, there is a milking barn that used to house four milk cows and it is now a small cabin with three rooms in it. Um, That's my favorite, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a really cool building. Uh, they're not uh, huge rooms, but they are secluded right off the creek. You can throw your pole right in the creek and fish from the porch. Uh, so it has, uh, it has expanded, and uh, we, we don't know. It may not expand any further, but... Uh, we have a daughter and a granddaughter, and uh, these are the two generations of the family will determine what's happening uh, going down the road. But right now, we're uh, doing, keeping very busy in the summertime and uh, uh, enjoying the buildings that we've restored. Uh, we still have, we have the old hog house that we haven't gotten done. And, uh, but we were given a cabin which was the homestead cabin of Frank Canton, who was one of the men arrested in the Johnson County War. So he was on the other side of the war from the Buffalo citizens and uh, has a rather shady background, but his, uh, his house was uh, in bad repair and uh, owned by a trust who said, you know, we're not gonna do anything with that building. Can we give it to you and you restore it? At which point, Earl said, oh, wonderful, another building. <laughs> so, so it seems like we have done a whole town, and I think that may be exactly what we've done. We have now six buildings, I think, that we've restored and more. And um, so uh, it's, uh, it's a minor city here. So with those six buildings, how many, how many guests can you accommodate here? We have basically 14 guest rooms. So depending on, uh, you know, some will house four, uh, some only two. So it depends a little bit on the configuration of the people that come. Uh, but we're certainly not a gigantic number of rooms. 
Um, and um, don't know whether, you know, we have considered adding rooms because the town company would like to bring their 45 member buses in, but we need 26 rooms for that. So it would be a fairly major expansion. We want to preserve the nature of the ranch. We've been very careful not to um, uh, change the size and nature of the buildings. So even though we added uh, additions to them, they're in um, sync with what was here before. So it still looks pretty much like the buildings did before uh, they were modernized. So would you start on one building and stay with that until that's completed and then move on to the next? Well, that's a, a good question. We really don't know. We've, there are two different plans. We've talked about adding uh, a few rooms, for instance, to this building, which could uh, easily have four more rooms uh, added to it. Or we've talked about doing a, another, a separate building, just making it in character of, of, of the branch, which would be either log or board and bat, something like that. And, uh, uh, we've, we've not signed yet, so... Well, let me interrupt to say that sure. while we were doing the restoration work, we did try to do one building at a time, and the whole family worked on it. So... Yeah, this we, was an, an entire family affair, for the most part, an yes. entire family affair? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you would come up here on weekends, mm -hmm. and Kirsten told me a little bit, your daughter right. told me a little bit about this. You'd come up from Golden and, mm -hmm. and work here, and it, Earl, did you go back to work on Monday? Yeah, I, I was here on the weekend, okay. and, and then I was back. And, and of course, our son Ken was here. Our son Andy from time to time was here. Kirsten was here, and Kirsten's boyfriend, later husband Rick, who was an electrical engineering student, uh, was here and worked with us in the summer. So we were all busy doing uh, tearing buildings apart and re redoing them, and sandblasting and all that kind of thing. So we did kind of focus on one building at a time, but you have to remember the buildings were in such poor shape when we got here, there wasn't a building you could stay in or live in. So we started. <laughs> we did pretty much. We stayed at Motel 8 for a while and then in Buffalo, and then we would come here and we started with the bunkhouse, just getting that to where we could live in it. And, and then we just went one at a time. And it's hard to remember now, uh, but that took an enormous amount of effort to do. I, I, when I think back on it, I wonder how we had the energy to try to do it. Well, we, we got within four months, we got the bunkhouse habitable. And so then we had a place to stay yeah. when we came rather than the end of the hotel. And uh, then we started working on the cookhouse. And that summer, um, uh, Ken and Rick were here and we had a young man from Quebec uh, who spoke no English but was on a, a year sabbatical from whatever he was going to do and he wanted to learn English so he volunteered to work for us for ribbon board so we had those three young men tearing apart the cookhouse and putting it back together with the help of, of a local carpenter because we are none of us carpenters so Sam Jensen helped us out and, and gave all of the technical knowledge that was needed. And by, I can't remember how long, it didn't take that long to get the, I remember we were installing windows in the fall. So it must have probably the next spring, the cookhouse was ready to move into. And this was what year? And this was 1991 still, okay. early 1992. And by 1992, Earl and I were living in the cookhouse. That was our home, and we turned the bunkhouse over to a, a hired man to help out with the cattle operation. So we had two two people working cattle, and then we had one house for us to stay in, and uh, it worked pretty well. Um, but but then it was okay. We had the 100th anniversary of the Johnson County War in 1992. And we kept looking at the eyesore, which was the old original house, um, and couldn't stand it. It's like, no, that has to be restored. And I, I think Earl was on board with that, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, they all thought I was crazy for restoring. It's like, no, no, you're a rancher. You don't spend your money on buildings. You spend your money on animals and hay. 
And it's like, well, I guess I'm not a rancher then. So we started working on the ranch house, but we knew it was a very important building. So we had a, a very excellent contractor come in to help us out. And one of the big things that had to be done was move that building and put a, an honest to goodness foundation under it so it wasn't sitting on the ground. Sure. And so we had a local pair of men who moved buildings come in, they jacked it up, they winched it south so that it would be totally clear of the old and they, they sighted exactly where the original foundation was so that we would not move it even an inch. And then they came in and put a partial uh, a concrete block foundation underneath it and winched it back onto the concrete block. And I can remember our, part, our contractor calling me in Golden because we weren't there when they were doing it. It was March when they were working on it, I think. And, uh, and, he, and I said to me, Barbara, I'm not sure that that foundation is going, they're going to jack it right back, you know, roll it right back over that new foundation. I said, Ivan, what am I supposed to do about that? I'm here in Golden. I, and he said, well, I, I'm not sure it's going to hold up. Okay, well, it will or it won't. And sure enough, they knew what they were doing. They got it moved back on, set down on those concrete blocks, and it's been there ever since, and it's just wonderful. And at which point, all the bowed uh, floor joists straightened out, if you could believe that. They had been bowed for probably 50 years. Oh, just the weight of the building. The weight of the building, because the exterior had sunk, and they had um, blocks underneath the, the joists in the middle of the mm -hmm. building. And so, and it was bowed a good six inches, I swear. And when they picked that up and set it on the foundation, the floor joists just straightened out. They were such good lumber, so it was uh, absolutely amazing, and well, no one could believe it. One other thing on that, the building was so heavy, those nine by 13 inch logs, that the steel frame that the movers used to winch it over, and they chained on the cottonwood trees on the south side and winched it off the cottonwood trees to move it over. But those steel bars were bowed, and that's why they were calling Barbara and saying, I don't know if we're ever going to get this inch by inch right square with the new foundation that we put in. You know, I, I've seen this back home when they move a house. They actually put big blocks of ice on the foundations, and they put they can put the building down. Oh, my. Now I don't know whether that's what happened here. No, they can put the building down, and then they use a tracker to just kind of right. rush it yeah, around to get it in the right place, and just wait for the ice to melt. <laughs> yeah, I know they did not do that here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They just guessed and checked the wind, <laughs> and, and they got it on. Uh, it was a miracle in a, in a way, but the building was much heavier than they had anticipated. And it just gave them all sorts of problems to get it done. But they got it done, and they did a very, very fine job with it. Now, you were talking about the wood joists and everything. Do you have any idea what kind of wood they used? Was it as far as woods like here? No, no. Okay. As far as we know, it's pine. Okay. That's what they were milling. And we checked to see which mill it might have come from. There was one in town. There was one at the foot of the mountains. And I think there was one in KC. Uh, so there were three that were active in the area, and we're not back in the 1800s. In the 1800s, okay. correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so you know all of the wood, of course, is the true size. They're two by twos and four by fours, and and uh, they're just wonderfully strong. But wood. the finished floor, like in the ranch house on the west end, was fir floor. Okay. And that's what when when bowed, that's what got destroyed. And when we were looking at this, there was all sorts of snow and leaves and debris in the room. And we were walking through it and stumbled onto something underneath that turned out to be, I think about a 1930s all wool rug. So we saved the rug and had it trimmed on the borders that were ruined and we still use it in the building. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, it was an amazing building. And when you look around at what those people did in those years, you just take your hat off because they did a wonderful job on the things that they did. And when, when in this process did you decide it was going to be a guest bridge? When, when did that start? 
what, 94, 95? I would say we made the decision to, to do it and then got started to get the ranch house done. And that was ultimately finished in 1997. So I think it was about 94, 95 that we decided we should do it. Um, so now there's a cattle business that had that started? We, yeah, we, okay. we, were, we had cattle here when we first moved in on the ranch. Oh, okay. And right. Tony Schiffer was our broker and he uh, bought the whole herd in Montana and had it trucked up here. In fact, we were at the motel having breakfast in town when the truck drivers were coming through with the herd. They didn't know us, and we didn't know them, but they were talking about this bleepity bleep herd that they were taking out to this bleepity bleep ranch, and here we were sitting here having breakfast with them. These stupid people from Colorado that stuck in the ranch, and they are just going, mm -hmm, you got it. Yeah. It's done, the whole thing's going to flop in no time. It's exactly. overnight. <laughs> All our neighbors thought we were just coming in to buy the ranch, fix it up, and then sell it and be gone. So they were all surprised when we stuck around. But we had a very good reception from the town, and they volunteered to put together the program to qualify this for the National Registry. It hadn't been on before because it was such a mess here. And, uh, and they did a very nice job with it, and, and it was put on the National Registry as a historic district, not because of the Johnson County War. Well, it's for both. It is also for the Johnson County War, so we missed it twice. Well, yeah, but I, when I looked at the program for it, it was really because it was a territorial era, complete branch, where you had to be self-sufficient from one end to the other, and that's why it's known as a district. Okay. Yeah, there's the stelling out front, the, the large sign mm -hmm. that designates it, that talks about both the county war and yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was here. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure Barb was correct on that, but when I looked at it, it was clear to me that the instant that they wanted to do it, it was because of the territorial era uh, completeness of it. Now, of course, the, uh, nobody did anything but the Johnson County War here in those years. This was a rundown, dilapidated place, and the barn looked every bit as dilapidated as everything else. And there weren't tours or guests or, or school kids or anything else. It was just the, the ranch buildings that, as they existed. But after we straightened everything up, uh, then it was a completely new new program. And, uh, and right away they started bringing, uh, I think Al Simpson sponsored a bill. He was our state representative then in, in uh, in the state legislature, sponsored a bill that for Wyoming history, the fourth grade kids would come and see what happened at the TA Ranch, and that goes on today. So we probably has the fourth graders every spring that come here in the buses, and they get the tour of all the buildings in the Johnson County War and so forth. But none of that had happened prior to when we got here and got it cleaned up and straightened up and so forth. So, uh, while the Johnson County War is clearly a key part of this operation, nobody would ever argue otherwise. I think the impetus was from the State Historic Preservation that, that this was a territory of our ranch. Barbara was telling you about the building, well, the milk barn, which we, she restored to guest rooms. The State Historic Preservation Office said this is one of the handful of chink and dog systems left in the state of Wyoming. Would you please, when you restore that, do the work so you have the chink and dog system? Well, the chink and dog system was the earliest form where you'd put willow branches on the base of the, of the lower round log, fill the chinking up to rest on the willow branch, and then the next log up would take over from there. And so it, it was a very cumbersome way of doing it, but it uh, had a real design effect on the room. Well, our contractors had to go out and find willow bushes on highway projects, get them cut, get them cured, trim them, bring them back, and put them up, and it turned out to be one hell of a project. But that's what we have in there now because of the state's historic preservation. And uh, that's why my memory is that they were, they were primarily interested in uh, 
originally what this was as a 1981 or 1981 to territorial era ranch that was completely self-sufficient from hog slaughter, you know, butchery, chickens, turkeys, uh, vegetable garden, the whole thing was, was done for them to just live here on what their own hands produced, which, which was re very remarkable. Now this chinking, I, I remember Kirsten telling me something about this. It's, this obviously you had never done something like this before, right, right. and I guess you had to go through a bit of an experimentation mm -hmm. process. Some of it you'd get up there and it would fall out and and that sort of thing. So well, we were yeah, we were fortunate that the we had two contractors that and that helped us with it, um, and we really didn't. The Coke House was the first building that we really had to put the chink in because it was rounded logs, so there was quite a gap between the log. And fortunately, our, our carpenter had worked with log buildings before, and he had quite a bit of technical knowledge about it. And he said, oh, yeah, you can fill in with um, uh, foam rubber, uh, and so you don't have to use quite as much, because it's basically concrete. Sure. And, uh, and then you can uh, put some sort of an easy, but I can't remember what it was, to, that will keep the concrete in there, keep it from falling out, and so we, we had a lot of help, which was uh, needed. We were total neophytes, had absolutely no clue as to what we were doing, but we did, uh, yeah, we, and we found that our young man from Quebec was a very fastidious, and he was, no, 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 let me do it, and he smoothed it out and just put it in there. It was absolutely beautiful when he was done with it, and that we have, but it's a it's a tedious job, you know, log by log, inch by inch. You spread that concrete in and make sure make sure it fills the hole. In later years, we found commercial products like log jam, that is wonderful stuff that you can put on. But this we mixed ourselves here with the advice from the contractor. We mixed it and applied it ourselves, and uh, so very one, much like the original. Yes, uh -huh. would, would have Absolutely. been used. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And one thing about the cookhouse that a lot of people have forgotten, that was a combination of buildings from an earlier era that were brought here later. And the, the main front of the building were all logs that were hand ads. And when we did the open house, after we did that uh, for the community to see, we had people come in and, and marveled at the skill of the people that had put those together because the logs on the room were all hand ads and you could see every blow from the ads to shape it, form it, and make it fit. That's very remarkable. So what we did was we restored two or three of those walls and then we uh, varnished them and so forth so that they would be preserved so people could come in and you can look at it today. And it is a very remarkable piece of work. That's incredible. When did you get involved in a lot? I know when I drive in here, I see these large pivots. I guess you're growing alfalfa and some other products. When, when did that come about? We started that about, I'd say, eight years ago. But what happened was, when I bought the ranch, when Barbara and I bought the ranch, it was flood irrigated with canvas dams and so forth. Okay. There was no technology. In fact, they didn't even have bridges over the creek to get around and so forth. So we did two things very early in the early 1990s. First, we put in a stock water pipeline system so that we could use our rangeland, our 6,000 acres of rangeland, and we pipe water up 13 miles to the whole system from a well behind the bar, and then we pump it to a cistern at the top and gravity flow it from there to, to the 13 wells for the livestock. That meant we can use all the, all the premises. So now it was necessary to get bridges so we could get equipment and so forth back and forth. So we bought uh, railroad flatbed cars, brought them in, and then put uh, block, uh, planking on top of them for our bridges. Uh, and then at the same time, we converted from flood irrigating all but one field to a wheel, what are called wheel lines. Those are the quarter mile long lines with a gasoline motor in the middle, and you put a pipeline in with your water. Every 40 feet, you have a riser, 
so that you connect from the riser to the wheel line with a big long rubber hose. And so you can move those at 40 foot intervals and irrigate your field. And so we, we put seven of those in at the same time. I can't remember. We must have had some money in the early years. It's kind of hard to remember having money. So that's what we did. And then. Well, your kids will thank you for it. Yeah. <laughs> and then later, about eight or nine years ago, we had some hay fields that are 90 plus acres. And it was taking so long to get the wheel line at each end to meet and then go back and cover it that we were burning hay uh, operations drying out before we could get back with our septic for the water. And so we experimented with a, a used center pivot on the north field and, uh, and then went from there to where two years ago we put in, we moved that to the south new field and then put in a new pivot here. So, so the north field is, it, that's the uh, field where as you enter the, the GA right. property, it's on the left side. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, so that's got the new pivot now, and we uh, took 11 towers and made seven really good towers out of that for our new seating on the south new field that's coming from the uh, restoration of the gravel operation here. So uh, that's, that's how that came about. But it's like everything on the ranch, it's just going from one step to the next step to the next step, and we keep finding things to do. Uh, now the guest ranch has expanded uh, quite a bit to conferences, special events, weddings, and so forth. So that's why we put in the pavilion. And then we're going to do some uh, lamping facilities for uh, camping on that too. That's a big market for us. That's so, that's that's lamping? It's a it's a it's in the form of, of travel where people want to sleep in tents. And it has become very, very popular with the millennial generation. We don't understand it because we quit sleeping in tents years ago. But this is new with them. And they don't even want, they don't want a bathroom in their tent. They just want a tent that's, and, but they want a very good mattress. They don't want to sleep in sleeping bags. But it's called glamping and it's um, very, very popular. So you provide a tent. They, we you know, provide the tent. What okay. we do is we put in a uh, a wooden floor mm -hmm. and, and wainscoting for that, and then canvas around for the tent. And then we'll have uh, a stove in there. Uh, it could be either propane or it could be just wood, whatever we wood pellets or what have you, and some minimal things in there so that if they want to make a sandwich or have their own meal in there, they have a, they have a way to do it. We used to do that in Yellowstone Park. You could rent a cabin and you'd have a, a wooden cook stove in there and you'd bring your utilities and fire up your cook stove and then you made your own, your own cook and then you would watch the bears gather around your house because they smelled the bacon. Uh, but that's the, that's the same kind of concept, but it's quite popular. And uh, the bank that we're working with uh, has had a great experience uh, with other clients doing the glamping, and so they were very affirmative that they thought this was a good plan for us to pursue too. So now, is there electricity? No, in these. No. Okay. No, so basically, it is, it is rusting. Then it uh, is rusting. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, the nice part about it is we could add rooms for less than a, a, you know our normal sure um, normally built building, and uh, we shall see. We're going to uh, start it. We will build those glamping tents or or found, you know, the base of it and put them up for next year. So we will start advertising and get clients in. We'll find out how popular it is. But our, our bank tells us that in southern Utah, in the midst of the desert, they have people who are willing to come in and pay big money just to stay in one of these tents. And we're going, sounds good to us. So there we are. We will give it a try. So it's fun. There's been a real metamorphosis. So you started out. Uh, yeah. This is going to be a cattle ranch, right. and now you're you're a guest ranch. Right. And now that's expanding. And now I spoke to a woman here who belongs to some sort of an organization where they they can bring their RVs to different places. Exactly. And and we've that since we didn't have the glamping facility done, 
it's called Harvest House, and they um, are allowed to stay here. They don't have any, we have no water, no facilities for them, and they know that from the get-go, uh, but they can get a horseback ride. They can come into the restaurant and eat. They can watch our horse demonstration, ride the wagon, do all the activities that we provide, and, um, and pay for them a la carte. And so it's been some extra income for us, it's been certainly extra exposure. So we have more people now that know the TA Ranch is here. So it's, it's not a bad thing. And uh, we'll see whether we continue with that. If we get glamping going, we may discontinue the big RVs. They kind of are at odds with each other. Sure. Uh, but well, we shall see. It's very interesting you're, you're talking about how the thing has, has grown and metamorphosed in a way. When we started with the guest ranch, after our attorney friend and his family were here and so forth, we focused on horseback riding and, and uh, training for people who learn how to rope and, and deal with things in the livestock industry. And we thought that what we would be marketing are these historic rustic ranch buildings. Well, as you move, the public wants more and more facilities, more and more amenities, uh, less and less rough it, uh, more and more sophistication. And so you've got to try to bridge the gap. You've got to keep what you have, as Barbara's pointed out, like all the buildings look like they did before. We can modernize them and add facilities for them. We have to keep in mind that uh, we want the same footprint and so on and so forth. But uh, people are demanding that the, the public that comes to a guest room today, they demand certain things. And even if it's glamping, that's, that's a different kind of demand, but that's exactly what it is. This is what they want. So you've got glamping on one end and people that want more and more sophistication uh, in their buildings and great amenities and so forth. So you have to, you advertise that you're a historic ranch, but people say, wonderful. Now show me this magnificent bed and facility that we have that we can use while we're here. Yeah. And, and so that's that's where you go. And uh, that's that's where we're going. Sometimes a little more reluctant than at other times, but uh, it's the way that you do it if you're going to be in the business and to supply this for those uh, customers. And that's what we're trying to do. What's highlight is when I, now I've stayed in two of the different buildings since I've been here. And I guess I've been here about five or six times. Yeah. It, it's the historic feel. I mean, it's all around you. And, it, and where else can you go and see a barn with bullet holes in it yeah. from the Johnson County Wars, you know, from, from the uh, cattle wars? The, the history is here. You just have that total feel of history while you're here, but you have those modern amenities, yeah. as you're saying. That, uh, that well, you can most sophisticated folks are looking for. It. You can thank Barbara for that because she's been very insistent on keeping the footprint and the feel of the buildings, and we have worked and worked and worked. When we've added facilities and things to the buildings, they've got to have the same footprint. Uh, the cookhouse now is probably five times the size of the original cookhouse, but if you drove in and looked at it with a cowboy from 1881. He'd say, well, that's the cookhouse. Yeah. And so that's that's what she's done, and it's just truly remarkable, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know of anybody that could have done the job that she's done here with the budget she's had to work with. And Barbara, when you started one of these buildings, you sit down and, and, and draft it on paper first? We and, did, okay. and, and we did a, ma a major expansion in 1997 um, when we, uh, when we turned this building into, and um, well, we didn't add the milk barn, but we did this. We increased the size of the, the bunkhouse and we finished the dining room in the cookhouse. And we did. And, and the ranch house. Well, but the ranch house, yeah. pretty much, we didn't need an architect for it. It was, you know, I, I knew what to do with it without it. But, yeah. but for but this I building, just, we did use an architect. I was just saying we did the whole plan and the new front entry right. and, and so forth. They had a they had a a building with a windmill for water on the Sherman, the very front of the ranch house. 
and now with our pipeline system, that was no longer necessary. Of course, it was. It would have been fun if the windmill had still been there, but, but it was gone. They, yeah. had, they had taken it down the minute the trees got too big. Yeah. Windmill didn't work. So, but um, it was, it was. Uh, you know, I certainly didn't do it all by myself. We had to have some architectural drawings to do this building, and uh, and the architect did a very very good job. We had advice from the State Historic Preservation Office, which said you've got to keep you've got to keep the granary the way it is so when you come in here you see the the beams and you see the catwalk up on top where when they came in they would walk the the windows were high up on that west wall and they would get across onto that catwalk they would open the the chutes the great chutes the, okay and yeah. and there would be a wagon underneath to receive the grain that was coming out. And the only time they had to get down on the floor was when the grain got so low, they had to use a shovel or a, a broom or something or other to shovel it over to the chutes. But um, we the were state, able to save all of that. The State Historic Preservation Office told us, uh, initially, I was very reluctant uh, to what they wanted. They said, if you're going to add to this building, other than just the grain part, then you're going to have to keep the roof line on that all the way across from the granary. And I thought, I don't think that's really necessary. Well, they thought it was. And you know what? It was a terrific idea. And it has made this facility a, a really neat facility to have and integrates well with the granary. And so there's a lot that we got from uh, historic preservation that were some really good basic ideas and they work very well with us. We, we appreciate it very much. Well, it's been a heck of a project. Yes. And it's ongoing. Yes. Oh, yes. It is. So now your daughter, Kirsten, is yes. she responsible for running the operation now? Or? She's taking over. We okay. we help, but we're retiring kind of. And, and so she is and with the help of her daughter and, uh, and right now her son, uh, so we have two of her children who are actively working with the guest ranch. Is that her Tucker? Yeah. Tucker. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And, right. Uh, and we shall see. He, I think, has plans for an education. But Katie completed her college education, and she's come back. We'll see if she wants how long she wants to stay. But she is uh, very actively involved in helping out. So there we are. And where else can I go and and the cook has a PhD. Yes, right. <laughs> Your daughter's phenomenal. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we have seven grandkids, and all seven have been at the ranch and worked at the ranch. Now, we don't have a requirement that everybody has to tow up and be a ranch worker, and, and we want them to go on so we have in law school and other educations and so forth. But they've all worked here, and they all come back from time to time. And so we hope that will continue into the future. And so only the future will tell. And pretty soon it's going to be their future because our future will have come to an end. Yes. Well, Earl and Barbara, I thank you for this time. This has been really, really interesting. Uh, I know I've been fascinated about this since I started coming here. And I, I would hear little bits and pieces of it from all of you. And to, to be able to sit down and Put it all together has been very, very interesting. Good. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Full story. Right. There you go. Okay.